Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from the Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Righteous anger. It's hard to pick up on, but beneath the surface of this encounter that Jesus has with those who come wanting to know his opinion about a group of Galileans, his own homesmen, his own kin, who had apparently, uh, though we have no historical record of this, it is fitting with the kind of things Pontius Pilate was known to have done. Uh, people come wanting to know what, you know, what do you think about your own people, the, that group of Galileans, surely you heard about them. They came to offer their sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem, the only place one could offer sacrifices. And somehow they got uh, sideways with the powers that be, and they were cut down by Pilate and his forces. Their own blood mixed with the blood of their holy sacrifices offered to God here in the temple. The temple desecrated by this act of violence. What, Jesus of Nazareth, you Galilean, what, what do you think about that? Righteous anger just below the surface. And no small amount of of wanting to assign some kind of blame for such a tragedy, such a horrific act. These are the things bubbling beneath the surface in this conversation that opens our gospel reading from Luke today. They want to find Jesus to be sympathetic to their righteous anger, an ally with them, in saying that this cannot stand. These Roman oppressors slaughtering us like the very sacrificial lambs that we seek to offer in sacrifice to God. And yet Jesus' response, no. No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. And to underscore his point, Jesus reminds them of another tragedy. Well, what about that group of 18? Apparently, they all heard about the tragedy of a tower, the Tower of Siloam, falling, some strange mishap, some terrible tragedy in which all of them perished. Did they perish in some state of curse or punishment? Clearly, Jesus believes that is what is the subtext of their question of him about the Galileans killed by Pilate. You get the sense that he could go on all day. What about that instance? And what about that occurrence? No shortage then or now of injustices and wrongs committed. Tragedies that unfold on the seemingly innocent just going about their day suddenly to have a tower fall on them, or the forces of nature rain down upon them, or the powers that be slaughter them like a lamb. Did they deserve it? Were they worse sinners? What? Why? How? To all of these, Jesus' response is consistent. No. No, I tell you. But unless you repent, 
you will all perish as they did. Perish as they did. Not in some state of curse or punishment, but like the fig tree, whom we will get better acquainted with in a moment, as they did, like the fig tree, in a state of unpreparedness, squandering the precious gift of life, taking up space in the soil, assuming that bad things happen to other people, putting off till tomorrow what should be our priority today. And so in that sense, yes, all guilty. Guilty is charged. But a resounding no from the Lord. Not once, but twice. No. Both to their and our righteous anger over injustice. A resounding no to the idea that their sins, or anyone's sins for that matter, caused their death. No to equating death with some sort of divine punishment or retribution. No. Of course, no. How could the God of the fig tree, the God of infinite grace and patience, with human ego-driven shortcomings and self-centered preoccupations, how could that God be so cruel and petty as to seek punishment for our sins and shortcomings? The parable of the fig tree. Ah, oh, what a gem. Some in Sunday school today weren't sure they had heard the parable of the fig tree. And I venture to guess many of you are saying the same thing. The parable of the fig tree. Where did that come from? Well, but from the lips of Jesus. The parable of the fig tree underscores God's ultimate desire to see humanity blossom and bear good fruit. Yes, we are the fig tree. Israel, the people of God, the body of Christ, the church, however you want to describe it. We are the fig tree in this parable, my friends. And it is God's desire to see us blossom and bear good fruit, to bear witness to the way of God, to the way of Jesus, to the way of Christ. We know not the outcome. Any more than the landowner knew, or the gardener for that matter, knew whether or not that sad, pathetic little fig tree planted in some corner of the vineyard. It's a vineyard, after all. As someone pointed out in Sunday school, what's a fig tree doing in a vineyard? Well, the landowner apparently wanted it. Loved it. Cared enough for it. Maybe he just liked figs. I don't know. But there in the corner of the vineyard is this odd fig tree. Unique and special all in and of itself. And yet, it hasn't done the thing for which it was planted to do. Enter the patience of the gardener for the fig tree, which cannot be stressed, cannot be overstressed. One commentator I read this week pointed out that if you were looking at the sort of standards and practices of ancient Israel around fig trees, in actuality, a fig tree would have had three years just to sort of be planted and to sort of come into its own. 
And then another three years, according to some Levitical law, which said you couldn't eat the fruit uh, for three years. So another three years after that, before the landowner would have come along looking to find whether there's any fruit on this fig tree. This fig tree is at least a good nine years old at this point. Anybody would have had been within their rights to say, this fig tree, I, you know, it's been almost a decade. I hadn't had a good fig off this thing yet. Let's, let's try something else. But the patience of the gardener, the one who actually works with the fig tree, the one who actually knows the fig tree, the one who has spent his sweat and his strength and his time working with that landowner's crops. Calls the landowner, urges the landowner, pleads with the landowner, suggests lovingly to the landowner that perhaps, perhaps they shouldn't give up just yet on the fig tree. Repent. If we want to understand what the, the parable seeks to communicate about us, us wayward fig trees taking up space in the corner of God's gar garden, God's vineyard, we must understand the notion of repentance. One of the great themes of Lent, of course. Repent underscores our need to wake up. Wake up, fellow fig trees, and ask, what will I do today? If today were my last day, if today were my last chance to bear fruit, my last chance to bear witness to the amazing grace and love and steadfast patience of God. What would we do? What would you do? What would you do differently? Who would we go to in hopes of mending severed relationships? Whose forgiveness would we seek? And to whom would apologies be offered? Our idea of repentance comes from that amazing little Greek word you've heard probably before from other preachers or teachers of Scripture, metanoia. Metanoia, which means literally to turn, to turn from whatever it is we've gazed upon for far too long, producing nothing good, and turn to that which can change us, transform us literally, convert us, bring forth fruit from us. Not a single turning, but a constant daily turning every day from the old ways of sin and death to the new way of Christ, the way of life and hope and grace. For each turn of repentance is another chance. Another free grace moment. In which we are given one more opportunity. One more year. To bear good fruit. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.